agroforestry systems are well integrated into farming systems by the creation of rows and alleys in which different crops are grown. And often these agroforestry systems are best integrated into farms uh, by growing them in areas where other crops cannot be grown. For instance, um, in salty areas or waterlogged areas, things like brushwood or salt bushes can be grown and therefore best be integrated with other crops and farming systems. A biodiverse agroecosystem can be quite labour intensive to create for a start and also we have to consider that these biodiversity elements that we introduce may compete with or at least replace some of that crop which we're, we're targeting. Some of these elements that we introduce to promote biodiversity may actually conflict or interact to some extent with other management practices such as fire management or weed control. Uh, for instance, if we introduce a herb layer, that may make it more difficult to control weeds. And if we leave a, a woody litter layer with logs and things like that, they, that actually may conflict to some extent with our fire management practices. In planning a biodiverse agroforestry system, there's three types of factors to consider. One is the complexity of that system itself. The second thing is the size of the plot. And the third thing is the location of that agroforestry system within the landscape. The best agroforestry systems have a number of different layers, starting from a, a tree or a canopy layer, a shrub layer, and also some sort of ground layer, some litter, some herbs, things like scattered logs and scattered rocks as well. In terms of size, basically the bigger the better. With habitat patches or agroforestry systems, the larger the area that that planting is, the more likely you are going to support particular animal species and the higher diversity of animals and plants that will be conserved in, in that plot. In terms of location, probably the best location for an agroforestry plot is adjacent or near other native vegetation. This is an important factor because plants and animals will then be able to colonise from these native woodlands into the agroforestry system. And it also becomes important when that agroforestry system is harvested that, uh, that particularly the animals can then seek some sort of refuge in the remaining native vegetation that's around the area. These agroforestry systems, when they're diverse in terms of their plant species, can support a high diversity of animal species, including insects. And a lot of these animals and insects may actually have broader farm level benefits. For example, a lot of the birds will eat insects, some of which will be farm pest species. Uh, ag agroforestry can also support wasps and hoverflies, which can also help to control pests in crops. The systems I'll talk about are brushwood, sandalwood, forage, timber and oil mallee. So brushwood is a group of Melaleuca species or tea tree species. They're often useful for growing in waterlogged areas where you can't grow any other sort of crop and they grow as a, as a simple shrub structure usually in, in rows or a small block and a lot of birds that use shrubby habitats tend to also use the, the brushwood systems. Sandalwood is a native small tree, it's a native species of WA. It's also harvested in the wild, otherwise it's grown usually in a, in a block or, or in rows. Uh, it's an interesting plant because it's a, a, a parasite of other trees. Um, in order for the sandalwood to get its nutrients and, and water, it has to parasitise the roots of another tree. So when we grow it in a plantation system, we need to grow it with a host species. And the most common host species in the wheat, wheat belt is Acacia cuminata, the jam wattle. But in the wild, there's probably more than 60 species that can be used as host. And sandalwood plantations have been grown with up to 40 different host species. So if you think about that 40 different species of trees and shrubs, sandalwood has a real potential to, to um, develop as a really complex system, similar to any 
sort of quite complex woodland with a lot of different variety of species and, and shrubs and that sort of thing. And because of that, sandalwood can, can support a whole lot of uh, different, different species of animals, uh, high diversity of birds, those that forage in trees, those that forage in the shrubs. And it tends to be a, a, a really good balance of a productive system and a good quality habitat. Forage plants are a group of perennial shrubs that can be grown to feed livestock. In the wheat belt they tend to be salt bushes and rigodias. They're perennial so they can uh, help to stabilise soils while you're still feeding livestock. Um, they're often grown in rows and they are a shrub level plant that can also provide uh, shrub type habitat and some birds that tend to specialise on shrub level habitats are often found in these forage type shrubs. Several different tree species have the potential to be grown for timber in the wheat belt. These include native eucalypts, native she oaks and also exotic pines. Um, they tend to be grown in either shelter belts or small woodlots. In terms of habitat, they offer a canopy, eucalyptus offer flowers and, and foliage, so they tend to encourage birds that forage on canopies. And the other tree-based system, uh, the oil mallies, can also be improved by adding a, a, a shrub layer and a, and a herb layer and those litter elements. Things like oil mallies are often grown in rows and their habitat value can be improved by using that row as some sort of dispersal corridor, so connecting remnant patches of, of vegetation. For all systems, whether they're shrub-based or tree-based systems, I would recommend uh, a focus on maintaining things like remnant trees, which are really hard to replace in the environment. All of these systems could also have a litter layer and a number of scattered logs and scattered rocks. In terms of the individual systems, improvements can basically be made by providing some of the layers which aren't present in that system in its standard form and probably most importantly add some canopy layer probably by including trees at the end of end of rows or that sort of thing and also including these remnant trees. So given that we've created this biodiverse agroforestry system the harvesting of that system is going to be a real challenge to that biodiversity. Um, one way of lessening the impact is to have a have a staggered harvesting regime over time and that will also be a, a staggered planting of these agroforestry systems. Although the vegetation is harvested that some of these other ele elements such as the logs, the rocks, the litter layer is disturbed as little as possible in that harvesting process. When I've worked on these systems in the wheat belt I've been really surprised and impressed at how much biodiversity can be conserved in these different systems and I think there's still a great opportunity to uh, expand on conservation that goes on in the wheat belt through agroforestry systems and I think there's also a huge potential to diversify farm incomes and also make better use of some of that marginal land that are found on farms.